Welcome to class 18 on topics in power electronics and distributed generation. In the last class, we were talking about uh, relays for uh, connecting DG for the DG operation for the interconnection and for protection. And uh, we linked it to the, uh, these requirements to standard ANSI relay protection usage. And uh, what you could do is then uh, uh, work out the logic required to say operate uh, the interconnection protection or the generator protection. So, each of those relay functionalities can be linked to under what conditions should some particular breaker for example, 52.3 when should it open and when should it close. Okay. So, that logic can be done as a fairly simple uh, 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 combinatorial logic exercise from the outputs of the relays. I okay. will leave that exercise to you. Uh, so, another aspect that need to be considered when uh, you uh, do such an interconnection is that uh, what should be the actual settings of the protection uh, relay values. For example, in this 59 uh, uh, under uh, voltage relay, the question might be what would be the uh, uh, neutral voltage setting that uh, has to be included or say for example, in the 51 g what is the ground current level, uh, what is the over current level, uh, at under what over frequency, under frequency would the decision be made uh, to disconnect the device. So, these are actually the engineering evaluations that you as a system engineer would have to decide on whether what setting is required. And those settings would typically be based on the analysis based on the ratings of these units, the sizing of the components, the fault calculations etcetera, which uh, you have got a feel for at this point of how to do those calculations. So, so another uh, thing to keep in mind is that uh, uh, in uh, these relays that uh, have are implemented all of them are quite uh, are standard relays. I mean you do not have something which is uh, not already there available as a standard. The only thing which uh, could be considered as uh, being something that is not already there is uh, the issue of uh, how to detect uh, unintentional islanding, especially when you have a wide range of situations. For example, you could use uh, this 32 as a reverse power uh, relay to actually detect whether the power is going out of your PCC to detect whether it is an intentional islanding, but then that would restrict you to have a DG where the power is not allowed to go out. If you have a say a large uh, solar farm or a large wind farm, your actual intention of operating the device is to send power out. So, you do not have a standard anti-islanding protection relay. Other than that, everything else is actually uh, standard protect, uh, protection equipment, which you could actually uh, program. Okay. The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, uh, scaling this uh, functionality to a, at a power level of tens of kilowatts or hundreds of kilowatts might be okay because you, uh, you need to add, say, the protective devices for interconnection, the sensors, etcetera. And in terms of the cost at uh, the hundreds of kilowatt power level, it may not be a significant cost addition to the DG cost in terms of uh, uh, the protection uh, additional equipment required for uh, interconnection and DG uh, protection. However, if you are now looking at a small 1 kilowatt uh, uh, solar panel that you want to interconnect to the grid and if you want all this functionality, then uh, the cost becomes uh, uh, a significant factor compared to your photovoltaic system cost. So, scaling it to lower power level is still a challenge. Uh, to some extent, uh, this uh, issue of scaling to lower power level can be overcome because now the digital controllers that are available today uh, can do a, a lot of complex functionality within one single controller. So, potentially you could then have a lot of this functionality now embedded within the controller of your uh, low power DG that you are trying to interconnect. But if you want to have 
separate relay packages to imp implement this, then scaling to lower power level is, uh, is a challenge. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, what we have shown over here is just an example. Uh, your protection requirements would change depending on whether it is uh, for example, whether the transformer is uh, uh, delta y, 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 y delta or the, whether the grounding is different, whether it is uh, low impedance, high impedance grounding, etcetera. So, you would have to actually modify your protection schemes to uh, accordingly to actually uh, address those uh, circuit uh, uh, and component issues that uh, you are uh, having in your actual example, uh, actual system. This is just an example to give you a, a feel for the issues that you would need to address when you are doing uh, interconnection of uh, a distributed generation generator to the grid. So, today we will look at another issue which uh, is uh, of importance is, uh, is that of uh, the voltage uh, uh, along the feeder and uh, the voltage at the feeder uh, especially at the point of common coupling is, uh, is an important uh, parameter. So, so suppose if uh, in this case if this was a high power facility and this was a point of common coupling, you want to ensure that that particular voltage uh, stays uh, close to the nominal value. Uh, so, you may not be able to have the voltage exactly at the nominal value, there might be some acceptable range like plus 5 percent, minus 10 percent and you want to uh, keep it within that range and you want to do that not just for one particular location, you want to actually do it all along the feeder. So, irrespective of whether you are close to the substation or whether you are sitting at the end of the feeder, you want to actually stay within uh, the tight range and physically it might mean that uh, irrespective of whether you are sitting at a distance 0 or a distance of multiple kilometers away, you want to actually make sure that uh, your voltage is in a, a tight tolerance range. Uh, how it is done and then the, we will also look at the issue of how adding a DG can actually affect uh, how the voltage regulation can be accomplished. So, we will start with a simplified uh, lump model of uh, the system, we will take the, the substation voltage, uh, the source voltage as V s and we will lump the impedance of the line uh, to a z line. Uh, which could consist of some resistance and uh, reactance to get the overall impedance. And again we will lump the load together at uh, one point and call it the load voltage and you have some load current being drawn. And we will assume that the load power factor is uh, some, um, it, the load current is at some power factor p. So, uh, we would be able to estimate what the resistance of the line is, what the reactance of the line is. We, in, we saw in the exercise where we looked at uh, calculating the x by r ratios of your line, uh, how to actually estimate these uh, parameters. And once you know the resistance and uh, reactance, you could then get uh, what would be the voltage that you would see at the load. If you have uh, the source at a uh, given voltage amplitude, you can then calculate what the regulation is. Okay. So, th so, you could then do it, what you do is uh, solve, do a phasor analysis. So, you have your, your source voltage V s, you have your current uh, I load lagging uh, at some angle uh, theta with respect to your uh, source voltage. Then, you can have a uh, a drop term corresponding to your resistance and you can have a drop term corresponding to your reactance and then find out what is the amplitude of your load voltage phasor. Uh, we'll, can, we can actually simplify this further because we will assume that the drop is quite small. So, we could take your the load current to be consisting of the in phase component, the uh, real term I real. 
and a reactive term and then you can calculate we can approximate your uh, your load voltage uh, as So, uh, we know that your I real is I load times P which is your power factor and your I reactive you can get your reactive component of your current and then you could uh, then uh, write down the expression that we had which was uh, V L and uh, substituting for uh, I real and uh, I reactive you would get this to be equal to V s minus some R L prime I load where R L prime is uh, equal to R L into P. So, from the real voltage drop term plus X L by R L square root of 1 minus P square and X L by R L is now your uh, X by R ratio of your feeder. Okay. So, so you can see that what we have done is we have taken a, a, a solution which would have been on phasor domain and then we have simplified it into as a algebraic equation. So, instead of ha, uh, every uh, phasor is a complex number, so it carries two real uh, values in it. So, here now we have reduced it to just uh, one real equation. Okay. So, so with that we can then calculate what is your voltage regulation at the load your, your voltage drop that you would see is essentially your amplitude of your source voltage minus the amplitude of what the voltage see, seen at the load and then you could uh, see what is the effect of uh, uh, now connecting loads all along the feeder. Okay. So, we will make an assumption that uh, you have a feeder where you have the source sitting at, at some point x equal to 0 and you have a line of length d and you are assuming that the loading is uniform all along the feeder. So, the load uh, the load per unit uh, uh, distance would be uh, I s what is the source seen at the substation end divided by d. Okay. So, you could think of I s as the substation current So, the loading is I s by d and uh, you can then calculate what your current would be uh, all along the feeder and uh, your uh, current would uh, be the maximum at the substation end and would reduce to 0 at the very end of the feeder. So, you can you have d i line by d x equal to I s by d and because it is reducing as you go forward. So, you have a negative uh, uh, slope. So, if you plot your uh, I line as a function of uh, distance versus uh, the 
point along the feeder you will get a current profile along the feeder uh, which is having a triangular shape. Okay. So, you can write an expression as I line of x So, now that you know what the, the current is along the feeder, you could then calculate what your voltage is going to be at uh, different points along the feeder. So, to do that, uh, you have, uh, if you consider a point uh, along the feeder, at some point x, I say this is d and this is 0, we can calculate v at of x plus some delta x uh, ahead would be equal to v of x minus uh, uh, so So, V at x plus delta x is V at x minus essentially the resistance per unit length times the small distance delta x times the current that is being carried at that particular point along the line. So, you can now substitute for I of x from the expression that we had previously. So, so you could write this as V of x minus So, you could then simplify it and then get delta V x by delta x to be equal to minus R L prime So, we could then in, uh, integrate this to get your uh, voltage along the feeder So, V at 0 is uh, uh, is uh, V s. So, you can write V s minus V of x So, essentially what you get is uh, you can write an expression for V of x, you will get that to be equal to V s minus some term as you proceed along the feeder. So, you get an ex expression for your uh, voltage uh, that uh, is actually parabolic. So, you get uh, V of x.
So, essentially you get a parabolic expression and if you look at uh, uh, I s by d, this is essentially the, the loading per unit uh, distance of the line. and R L prime by D is essentially the effective resistance per unit length inclu including the terms considering the, the power factor term. And, uh, Essentially, the objective then is that uh, if you have a profile along the length of the feeder which is parabolic, you want to fit this particular profile to be uh, uh, equal around a nominal value. So, if your nominal value is some v norm, you want this profile to be sitting right across straddling the, the nominal in a symmetric manner such that one end does not see over voltage and the other end does not see under voltage. If you keep it uh, such that uh, you are straddling the nominal, uh, all ends of the feeder would give you a, a fairly uh, uh, close value to the nominal. Okay. So, you might say that uh, your, your maximum voltage might be some V norm uh, with uh, some uh, delta percentage. So, say some delta by 100 and your minimum might be V norm into 1 minus some delta by 100. So, depending on what your delta is, you want to keep the entire uh, feeder voltage to be within this window. Okay. Then the other thing that can be noticed is that uh, you are not trying to keep the voltage at the uh, substation end to be exactly equal to the nominal, you want the voltage which is some distance away to be the nominal, so that your overall feeder voltage requirement is satisfied. So, typically uh, if you look at trying to fit a parabola uh, uh, along the nominal, you will find that roughly about 30 percent of the distance, if you keep that particular voltage to be the nominal, then you would fi fit this requirement of uh, being able to keep uh, your overall voltage within the uh, value of uh, plus or minus V norm plus or minus delta percent range. Okay. And then you could ask what could uh, would be done in a typical distribution system to adjust the voltage uh, along the feeder. Okay. So, one thing you could have is a, a tap changer at the substation, you could have an online tap changer OLTC which could adjust the tabs to actually uh, get such a profile such as this. So, uh, tap changer would do it for all the feeders at the substation. You could also have, you could also have a series voltage uh, regulator. You could have a series voltage regulator one for each line. Uh, these regulators can be located either at the substation or it, if you have a really long feeder, it could be further down the feeder. Uh, to get your required uh, voltage to be within a acceptable range. Okay. and typically that is at the substation or you could have a series voltage regulator. Uh, to uh, get your profile in a, uh, in a desired uh, range. Okay. 
and then you could ask uh, what would be the objective of uh, the, the say the tap changing transformer. Uh, so, one objective would be to uh, ensure that if the primary voltage coming in at the substation is high or low, you need to ensure that the distribution voltage is independent of changes that might happen on the primary side because your transmission level voltages might go up and down depending on what is happening on the overall larger system, but you want to keep your distribution voltage uh, constant. Uh, the other thing is to regulate your uh, voltage along the feeder. Okay. Uh, so, the second objective might be to regulate the voltage at say 30 percent point So, uh, so you could adjust the taps on the high voltage side to meet this requirement and one needs to keep in mind that you are not actually uh, uh, commanding your, your low voltage side, your 11 kV voltage side to be exactly equal to nominal, you are actually commanding your voltage on the secondary side to be some nominal value. plus some boost voltage corresponding to the impedance up to the 30 percent distance times your current that is being drawn by at the substation. Because you physically cannot take a sensing wire put it few kilometers out to sense the voltage at that particular point. What you physically have at the substation is the voltage at the substation. So, you are making use of the line currents that you know that is coming through the feeder to actually uh, predict what is hap what is the voltage that would be there at 30 percent distance down along the feeder. So, essentially you are adding a boost term to the voltage, uh, so that the boost term would correspond to essentially uh, this particular value above the nominal which you are trying to boost. So, in a transformer such as this, if you are say uh, operating at tap 1, then your voltage uh, step down ratio is higher and if you are operating say for example, at a tap n over here, you will have a higher voltage now coming on the secondary side. So, by adjusting your tap points, you can get your desired voltage at the secondary point. Okay. Then uh, you could say for example, in a situation such as this. Uh, you have uh, tap changes where you might de-energize the transformer while changing taps, uh, but you do not want to de-energize uh, entire feeder, uh, the output of the substation every time you switch from one tap to the other. So, you would have uh, on load tap changes where say for example, you can have a mechanism such as what is shown over here to actually ensure that when you are changing from one tap to the next tap, you do not have uh, over current. Say for example, if you, uh, if you directly close switch 1 and 2, you would end up with a short circuit in that particular loop. Whereas, say for example, if you want to go from uh, switch 1, so you might, uh, what you might do is when your position of your pole is uh, at the top point, you might say close uh, switch 2 and then essentially 
these resistors would limit your uh, your current that is uh, flowing in this particular loop through that transformer. Then as you shift your pole from the top to the middle to the, uh, the to the low point uh, of your contact then essentially you will always ensure that you have uh, 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 energy flowing through at least one particular circuit it might be uh, through this particular circuit or through this particular circuit, but you will not have a short because you al always have a resistance in the path and eventually you will come to a point such as here and then uh, at this particular point you will have 1 and 2 closed and then you would open 1 and then you would continue with position 2. So, you could have tap changings when you are still energized your, your loads are energized and that is why it is called a on load tap changer. Okay. So, so when you are trying to do, uh, do such an action you, you could also have say for example, uh, a series voltage regulator also functions in a similar manner you could have series voltage regulators at the substation end or uh, further down the line. So, if you have for example, a really long feeder which might be may, uh, of the order of 10 kilometers a long feeder, then if you just allow one particular the substation to regulate the voltage, you might end up with a large drop in voltage all along from one end to the other end. So, to prevent that you could then add say a series voltage regulator say in between the line to obtain the necessary boost. Okay. And then the question is what happens when you connect uh, a DG uh, to a system such as uh, this. Okay. So, once that you connect a DG to a system such as this, we will see that uh, you could have a DG that is connected at different points. It could be at the feeder, it could be in the middle, it could be at the end could be just above the series voltage regulator or just downstream. Uh, so, we will look at the different possible cases and we will see that now if we have DGs that are uh, of a reasonable size. So, the power rating of the similar magnitudes of the feeder uh, power, then you could have situations where you might end up with uh, maybe uh, under voltage at the end of the feeder or you might have over voltages at different locations on the feeder uh, based on uh, uh, your DG connection. Okay. So, we will look at uh, the different uh, cases. So, the first case uh, we will look at is when there is no DG and this is what we uh, uh, discussed. Uh, uh, you have a triangular uh, current distribution along the feeder uh, starting from the uh, substation end. Uh, up to the end of the feeder and you end up with a uh, parabolic uh, uh, voltage profile along the feeder. Okay. We will we'll then consider the case when you are adding a DG. So, the first case that we will consider is uh, adding a DG at the substation end. So, you have the substation and say you connect a DG right at this point at x equal to 0 and we will assume that uh, the DG power equals to the overall feeder load. So, essentially you have the same current profile along the feeder as what you had except that now uh, because you are dg power is equal to the substation power essentially it means that uh, what is now coming in from the substation end is actually zero because your feed your dg is actu actually providing the entire power so you, you can see in this particular case the voltage profile would st still be parabolic but uh, now you don't have say a boost term at the substation because the current that the 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 operational uh, sensors see at the substation would be 0 because the entire power is being provided by the DG which means that uh, at the end of the feeder you now have a situation where your 
your voltage is uh, so the, the feeder end would see a reduced volt voltage compared to the case when there was no DG. Okay. So, this is because the, uh, uh, the uh, OLTC in this case is not adding a boost term. You could then look at another situation where you have uh, a DG connected at the end of the feeder. So, you are looking at a situation where the DG is connected at the end and if you look at the shape of the current profile, it is uh, the same triangular current profile, but uh, I have shown it as being negative because instead of the current now flowing from the substation towards the end of the feeder, the current is now flowing in the other direction, uh, which means that uh, uh, essentially you would have the maximum current at the end of the feeder and because the dg power is equal to the entire feeder power uh, uh, and we are also assuming that the dg uh, power is being injected at the power factor that is required by the feeder uh, in this particular uh, situation. So, essentially at x equal to 0 uh, you would have 0 would be your uh, feeder uh, uh, your your actual current that is being drawn in drawn from V s. Okay. So, in this case again uh, you do not have a boost term, but now instead of having a voltage drop you have a voltage boost which is now coming towards the end of the feeder and uh, if you look at the voltage you will end up with essentially a higher voltage at the end of the feeder than what you had at in the nominal situation. And so, here you see a increased voltage at the end of the feeder compared to the case when you did not have. Uh, DG unit connected. Okay. So, we will look at uh, another situation where uh, you have a DG connected at the end of the feeder, but now the DG power is equal to essentially half the feeder power. Okay. So, essentially you are injecting I s by 2 at the end. Okay. So, if you look at it then uh, again assuming the uniform loading and uh, the conditions uh, for the analysis. Now, the second half of the feeder would be uh, the power would be provided from your DG unit. The first half of the feeder the power would be now be sourced from your substation. So, if you now look at your overall uh, voltage profile on the feeder you would have essentially now a parabola not just a part of uh, what we saw you would have two parts one corresponding to uh, the portion from the substation end and the other uh, uh, considering the portion from the DG end. Okay. So, you, so, you could see that now there is uh, also a reduction in the amplitude of uh, the voltage that you are seeing across the voltage drop that you are seeing across the feeder. So, we will then look at another, another possibility where uh, instead of uh, uh, of the, uh, the DG being connected at the end of the feeder, we will look at a situation where uh, maybe the DG is connected uh, uh, further uh, in between on along the feeder. So, you are injecting I s by 2 uh, so half the feeder power, but located at 3 fourths the distance along the feeder. Okay. So, you can look at then your uh, current profile, uh, it will again be triangular in shape, you have a, a jump of I s by 2 at the 3 fourth distance. So, in this particular location there is power flowing in, uh, in either directions from the 3, three fourth point for the first half you have the power flowing from your uh, sub, uh, source V s. So, if you look at the overall voltage profile you will see that 
there is a, a further improvement in the voltage regulation in the second half of the feeder. Okay. So, then you could ask if you had a single uh, a DG unit and where your power could be appropriately, uh, it could be sized to the appropriate power level, uh, where could, where, where would be the ideal location for locating such a DG and what would be the power level at which uh, you could operate. And then you would see that uh, uh, if you have a DG unit which is uh, uh, two thirds of the rating of the feeder power. So, so at the uh, two thirds power level located two thirds of the distance away from the feeder, then essentially you will see that uh, uh, your, uh, you will end up with a voltage profile which is uh, quite flat. You, what you would see is compared to the case of your uh, your case where you had uh, no DG, you will see that the voltage regulation along the feeder compared to your, this was your case 1 and this corresponds to case 6. Compared to case 1, you have a factor of 9 uh, uh, reduction in your voltage along the feeder. So, you can see that it is it is become almost flat compared to the nominal uh, condition by adding a single DG of appropriate size along the feeder. Okay. But uh, again keep in mind that uh, this is a static analysis, the actual load on the feeder would be changing depending on the time of the day and uh, uh, citing a DG at a particular point will not be feasible in all situations and you also know that the loading, we have made assumptions on the loading etcetera, but you can get a feel for what is the possibility in terms of improvements and what where are the what are the situations where you have concerns uh, there is a, a possibility of over voltage or under voltage in different locations and uh, you also have by appropriately uh, citing or appropriately having your dg units it is also possible to get a flatter profile all along the feeder okay So, if you look at the ideal situation where if you had uh, 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 a situation rather than one DG you could have multiple DGs, then the ideal situation would be the where every facility on your feeder has a DG where uh, whatever power is being consumed by the DG uh, by the load at that particular location is being sourced from the DG which means that essentially your uh, uh, your voltage all, all along the feeder would be totally flat, you are not drawing any power uh, which means that the losses along the feeder would be eliminated. And we will uh, also look at what the loss comparison would be for the case 1 and case 6, okay, the, uh, what would be the distribution losses. So, if you look at the power dissipation on the feeder, we saw that our line current is uh, I s and if R is your uh, total resistance of the line. So, R L by D is the resistance per unit length. You can calculate the power dissipation at some 
uh, over a section of delta x at x okay. Over that incremental length delta x is i line square of x times r l by d times delta x, which is essentially the resistance of that particular section, and uh, we can substitute for uh, we could then calculate the total less, less, uh, loss by integrating over the entire length of the feeder 0 to d uh, p delta x p d x. So, this would be equal to 0 to d again this is uh, we have the same assumptions of uniform loading etcetera and so you could evaluate this put integral as So, this is uh, the, the loss per phase of the feeder. So, you could multiply that by 3 to calculate the 3 phase losses. So, if you now compare with case 6, where you had a dg of 2 thirds ratings located uh, 2 thirds of the way down the feeder, you could then consider. Uh, each of this case as one small feeder of this particular size and three such uh, sections uh, one over here, a section over here and a section over here. If you look at the, the profile of the current in each section, it is similar to what you have in all three sections. So, you could calculate the losses in one section and take three times that particular amount. So, So, you can see that uh, again you have a factor of 9 so the reduction in losses is by almost an order of magnitude. If you have a well sized DG which is well sighted, uh, even a single DG can actually uh, bring down the losses by quite a bit. So, you can see that uh, there can be uh, substantial improvement in terms of uh, reduction in losses and possible uh, improvement in voltage profile by uh, uh, appropriately citing DG 
which you would have also, also heard from people who talk that okay, there can be possibility in reduction in uh, transmission distribution losses by uh, DG by introduction of DG into the system. Uh, we will also look at in the next class at the case where what could happen in the case where you have other types of distributions. For example, one can look at the case where what we have studied so far is the case of uh, a radial distribution system. You could look at what would be the impact when you look at uh, say a, a ring type of distribution system. Uh, you also have challenges when you have uh, DG in uh, a network type of distribution systems. So, we will look at some of those issues uh, in the next class and look at uh, some of the power quality related issues and uh, the concerns that again come up when you have uh, distributed generation connected to the grid. Thank you. Thank you.